Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. No matter what time of the day you're with us today, we really appreciate you joining us for our weekly broadcast of the Chimney and Fireplace Success Network. Just like every week, we've got a really great topic for you today. Hey, one of the things you can do is share this out so others can hear this. Every single week, the three of us get together and we try to come up with a really good topic for that week. And what we're going to be talking about today is GPSs, GPSs to get you to your dreams and how you set that dream destination, which is vastly important for every human being. Cheryl, what will be your overview of today's broadcast? Well, we all have destinations that we think are going to happen. We have many destinations that we never reach. And that's the way I, the reason I like the GPS thing. My GPS doesn't always give me the right directions either. It will get me there, but it will take me the wrong way before it does. And so as we go through life, our GPS is not, even though it's set, it can change. And the, a lot of times we'll change directions and we have to reboot our GPS because it's not working. That's it. What about your overview for today's broadcast, Brandy? Yes. Um, so I like to take the road less traveled. That's what I always say in life. So I'll be uh, pushing that message today. And then I think part of the problem is a lot of people don't have any idea where they're going. They just have no clue. They're just kind of fluttering through life. And so I'll be talking about with this, how to put that on paper and then how to adjust because it's not going to look like what you write down today. Dead on the money. So stick around with us. We'll be right back and we'll get rocking and rolling with today's episode. So welcome back. And what you're looking at right now is three different individuals. And I will guarantee you that if we look back through the history of our lives, if we look when we came out of high school, the dream destination we had at that point is not where we're at today because we have made transitions. We have hit detours. We have hit potholes. We have hit major walls in our lives. So our dream destination has not always been the same. Cheryl, let's start with you. When you got out of school, what was your dream destination at that point? Where did you want to be at the age you are today? Where did you want to be? Honest answer, I don't know. I was not one of those kids that sat in school and dreamed about where they were going to go. I came out down towards the end of my senior year and computers were just becoming the thing. Of course, the computers of my days, which most of the people listening here doesn't realize were as big as houses. So I went off to computer school thinking that I was going to be a superior computer technologist. Okay. So you came out of high school and you imagined that your dream where you were going to be was a master of computers, which if I'm correct, they weren't little bitty PCs in those days. Those computers took up entire rooms and they had tapes running and all kinds of things. Am I correct? That was actually when you didn't, I mean, you keep, you card keyed things in. And then when you programmed the computer, you ran this, this cord from here to here and from here to here. We actually did what that little phone in your phone does now, except we did it with live wires. Okay. And, didn't take me long to figure out that was not where Cheryl wanted to be. Got you covered. So, Brandy, you went through school. You have completely changed the occupations and professions in that time. Because when you came out of school, you had a desire to enter a certain industry. I'm presuming this was something that formed as you went through school. And when you came out, you started pursuing this. So what was your dream destination that day that you got your high school diploma? Yeah, so my grandmother was a nurse and so, and her and I were very close. We were a lot alike. And so I wanted to follow in her footsteps and go to nursing school. And so that is what I did. And I thought I would be doing that until I retired, be doing it for the rest of my life. Um, 
you know, there's always things that get in the way. Um, so, and some things are good, some things are bad. One of the good ones is my son was born and I thought I cannot go back full time. And I called up my boss and I said, I either come back part time or I don't come back at all. And she said, we'll take you part time because part of my goal was to always be home with the kids, not always be home with the kids, but be with the kids as much as I could. I wanted to be present. So I did that for, gosh, maybe 16 years I did nursing. Um, and then I transitioned into the fireplace and chimneys in 2013. And again, nursing was starting to take up much, much, much more time because I was now in administration. And so um, I wanted to be somewhere where I could take off and go to my kids' field trip, take off and go to their homecoming parade. And so coming into Flues Brothers allowed me to do that. It right. gave me flexibility. Yeah, and let's get real. If we look at it, you and Jeremy actually met, if I'm correct, because he was head, he was into nursing. So y'all met there. And I can guarantee you, neither of you had an idea that at this stage of the ball game that he would be a chimney sweep. You would be working and y'all would be co-owners of a chimney sweep enterprise there in Kansas City. Am I correct? Never crossed our minds. Never crossed your mind. In my case... When I came out of high school, my desire was I wanted to become an architect. So what I was doing, and I actually enrolled into a community college and started taking architectural classes and becoming an architectural draftsman. But as I went through this, I found out that the true earnings of most architects were as draftsmen, and it really wasn't that great. There's just not that many high paid, high compensated architects. It's kind of like a little industry that you work in an office and, you know, it really, after a couple of months, like this isn't what I want to do. So at that point I turned around and it was like, okay, you're already in the printing business. You're already making a fairly good salary, better than those draftsmen are making. So that's when I delved into that. And at that point in life, I would assume that my age today, I would be sitting with retired with social security and living on a pension which is definitely not where we're at today. That's kind of my life story of how things went on. So Cheryl, let's go to you next. If I were to ask you at your age, which you and I are much older than Brandy. So where do you see your dream destination is today? 110, but it's, it's a longevity of life. My destination is I am not looking to retire. I've done all the retirement things. Uh, I really don't see a different destination than the path that I'm following now. Really, just uh, I like where I'm at. I like what I'm doing. Um, do I? Do we? We have the availability to travel if we wish. So I don't have to retire to to do that. Uh, back when I drove a tractor trailer, I saw the country from one end to the other. So I've got, that's out of my bucket. So my wishes are very small right now. It's just to live a comfortable life. Everybody healthy and safe around me and um, just be a good grandmother and mom to my kids. Right. And, you know, I think that's something unique in the hour destination because I don't think either one of us will ever retire and sit back in a rocking chair. That's not us. If we were to do that, knowing you, knowing myself, we would go crazy. We're just not those kind of people that that suits us. If you heard what Cheryl said, she really likes what she's doing. And that's vastly important. And that's what we're going to get to today in this as we go forward. What about you, Brandy? Can you share what your dream destination is at this point in your life when you are, let's, let's just take an example. You are the age of my children, okay? Mm -hmm. So now move yourself forward that you become the age of Jerry and Cheryl. <laughs> what, would be, what would you want to be doing? What is that dream destination for Brandy? When you yeah. <laughs> yes, if you'll allow me to share my screen, Jerry. Okay, put it um, up and we're going to put it on. There I'm an you. extremely visual person. I wrote this with like like my computer pen. I'm an extremely visual person, so I have to kind of think it and map it out. 
So here's today, the age of your children. And then here's where I would like to retire. Here's where I will probably have grandchildren to take care of. So between now and then, I would like to do a little more traveling, take care of the business. Um, we are very happy with the size we're at. We don't want to grow anymore. So I wouldn't say we want to grow the business, but just continue with our great reputation here in Kansas City. And then around this 2032, I want to have some people in place so that I can share time with my grandchildren and, and help not raise them, but babysit them because our parents did that for us and it was so valuable. And then I'm kind of like you guys. So this, I just put this in, this is when I'll be 65, but I don't think I will ever really retire. I don't think I've actually seen how that hurts people. I've actually seen people retire and then they get all sorts of health problems and it's just not good to sit around and watch TV all day or play, even play golf all day. At least you're outside for that. So this is kind of just my generalized timeline, but you know, I, I would bet if I could draw a line, it would actually, it's actually going to go way sideways and over because there's just so many things that get in the way. Um, you know, right now, um, life is, is going along pretty good, but I could develop a health condition or one of my kids could. There's just so many things that can get in the way of it that you always have to be ready to adjust. Right. And, you know, that's what I call the potholes, the, the walls that come up and the things that life hands you as you go through this. I mean, when I look at it, I look back at January 23rd of this year. I had no idea when I got out of the bed that morning that later on that morning I was going to be in a cath lab getting stents put in for my heart. Had no idea whatsoever that that would change as it did. And, I, and people often say, they look at me now and they say, you know, you don't look like you've had a heart attack. You don't act like you've had a heart attack. It's like, no, I've got to drive to just keep doing. In fact, those two days in the hospital, it was one of the hardest things in the world for me not to, to ask Cheryl, will you please bring my computer up here? I'm dying up here. I got to have, got to get out with people and do those things. So as you look at it, but that's where I want to go to with this today. I want to take this to the point of, if you are giving us the courtesy of listening to us today, of where you have to form that dream for you. And you see, that's one of the things that I see is happening a lot, is people become affected by the thoughts of others. You heard Brandy say something while ago. And Brandy, I'm coming back to you in a minute. She had made, her and Jeremy made a decision that the size they wanted to grow their company to and stop at was 15 people. And she was solid locked into this at that point, guys and gals. That was dead on the money of where she wanted to be. Not any way, shape, or form around it. So Brandy, as you went through, number one, why did you have this ceiling that you put on and then what caused you to alter that plan? Well, part of it, to be honest with you, is just some of the laws that you have to comply with the more employees you get. Um, but really what it comes down to is we knew that when we added more people, we would have to put key people in place because we couldn't manage 15 people or above 15 people on our own. And so now that we've gone above 15, we have those people in place. We have our um, field manager. We have our director of operations. I have an office manager. So now we can grow a little bit, but I'm actually happy where we're at with 18. I do not want to go to 20 now. <laughs> so you're happy where you are. So Cheryl, same question to you. You know, a couple of years ago, you assumed ownership of IBD, turned it into IBD outdoor rooms, full-time occupation, running a manufacturing facility. Then you decided that you wanted to come into coaching with me and working within my company doing certain things. And you decided that you wanted to become Ziegler certified as a trainer and a coach. And along with that, you also made a decision to become a disc assessor and a color code assessor 
and knowing more things about people to help them. So what was the reasoning that you changed this dream destination? Because most people would say, hey, you own a manufacturing plant, it's lock, stock and barrel. Jerry has no control whatsoever of that business. So everybody's aware that it's your business. What made you to, at, at the age you were, because you were in your 60s, why did you make that decision? Well, first of all, I have two perfectly competent children, adult children, that take the business and they run with it. Do I go in once in a while, operative word, once in a while? I'm here if they need me. But a lot of it was the disc assessment and the color code, I've always been a people watcher. I've always wondered why I was like I was. What made me intricate? What made you intricate? Brandy, the world. And so that's where the color code and the, the disc assessments came. It gave, I, I started for knowledge of myself was the main thing. And once I found out who I was and what made me tick, I took it to the next step there and then again to the next step, which puts me at the highest point of disc assessment that I can go. Can't go any higher. I'd probably still be learning. As far as going into the Ziegler, I could not for a lot of years because and that a lot of people don't know this, but we I, we use raised your parents. We became I became an empty nester at 62 from parents. So. I couldn't delve out and do a whole lot prior to that. I was pretty much stuck at home on a heavy basis, but I knew our time was getting close. And finally I decided I wanted the, the certification was, it's just a sticker if you use it for that, that's what it is. But I like the teachings of Ziegler. I wanted what I could learn from him to teach to other people. I'm pretty much where I'm at going to be in life. This is, well, maybe not, but um, unless I can think of another job to go into, but I wanted to get other people to that same situation. And that idea of being the best you was what I was diving for, not for me, but for everyone close by. So a lot of my drive and ambition was just to help people. And it's because I had a lot of people there with me when I made steps through life. I mean, my dad was always behind me. We were just, I had, I had that reinforcement that I needed and I wanted to be the reinforcement for others. Gotcha. So as you listen, both Brandy and Cheryl made decisions on their own that they wanted to change their directions. So Brandy, let's go to you. You were very successful in the medical profession. In my opinion, you were probably a super nurse. You have never cared for me except some phone <laughs> calls we've had, but I can only imagine how effective you were as a nurse. So now you went through nursing school. You have gotten a very good job. You got great benefits. You've got all these things going. You've moved to an upper echelon. If I'm not mistaken, you were actually trimming other nurses. Am I correct at this point? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Throughout. Yeah. Throughout time. Okay. So you kind of hit this culmination of not only becoming a super nurse, but a person that's trimming others in the nursing profession. So then one day it's like, OK, I'm going to go out of that. But at the same time, I know that you keep your nursing certifications up, okay? A lot of people need to understand that. You're still keeping those certifications up. You could step right back into that role any day. But what made you change to start working in Flues Brothers? Yeah, it's kind of a funny story, Jerry. So the hospital that I was working at, they wanted master degree nurses. And so I actually went back to school, which I love school, and got my master's degree. Eight months after I got my master's degree is when I went to Flues Brothers. It sounds crazy, right? Like I paid for this nice degree and now I'm and now I'm leaving. 
Um, the change really came out of necessity. Our office manager that we had at that time, we just had one and she was moving back to Wisconsin. There was a boy she liked and it was October and Jeremy's going, I have no idea what we're going to do. I don't have time to train a temp, anything. And I decided I had been offered a promotion at the hospital, but I knew that it was going to take a lot of hours and take a lot of time away from my kids. So I made the decision. I told Jeremy, well, I'll come and help get you through the spring. And then I can decide what I want to do with my nursing career. And of course, you know, you guys are type D or disc D type A. So, you know, that wasn't enough. I, you have to do many things. So then I was teaching nursing at night after I left Flues Brothers um, at the Catholic College here. And then the hospital didn't want me to leave completely. <laughs> they asked if I would at least stay on PRN. So I was also working a day or two at the hospital. Um, and that that became too much. I had to I had to really look at what direction I wanted to go. Did I want to keep teaching because they had offered me um, a full time position? I was adjunct before that. Did I want to go back to nursing and go full time, or did I want to be in the chimney and fireplace business? And so I had a big decision to make, and I decided that I'm going to be in the chimney and fireplace business for now. I always say for now. I've been doing it for eight years. Who knows what the future holds? I don't want to set it in stone because, as I said, there's so many things that can get in the way of that. Right. And let's add this in. You and I have a unique relationship and we may talk and you may share with me where you want to go. But I do know this, that Jerry is not going to affect your desires. You're going to make Brandy's decision. It will be what Brandy feels right. Even as close as we are, my you may listen to my input, but I'm not going to change Brandy. It's not going to happen, which is part of the relationship we have because we have so much respect for each other's points of view, which if you know the two of us, they're vastly different in so many ways. But if you look at these two ladies, when they made those decisions, they, made, they decided they were serious about these things. Cheryl packed up. Cheryl, how long you, you spent how many weeks in Dallas, Texas going through your coaching? First, your certification as a trainer, then as a coach. How many weeks did you spend at Ziegler headquarters? Uh, it was there was a full week for the Ziegler legacy and then another full week for the coaching. And then the you know, I've kept my certifications up in those. So I've got several, several months under my belt. Right. away from here or there. Yeah. And you have to maintain your certifications, which means you have to go through hours of classes each year and also pay fees. And Brandy, you do the same. You are keeping that nerve because you can't keep your nursing certification active without the CEUs. Am I correct? Correct. Yes. And I worked way too hard for that to let it go. Right. So listen carefully what they say, because they made these decisions based on what they wanted to do. Now, my direction in life was basically forced on me because I had a very successful business. I was in the fireplace business. I'm in the chimney service industry. I've got a manufacturing division. I got piles of employees and everything is really going good. Cheryl, if we go back to 2007, 2008, how good were things in business for us? Because, well, on top of that, let's add in, Cheryl also owned a limousine business during this period of time. So, and she made this decision, believe it or not, on a Monday, and she had a limousine on Monday afternoon, right, Cheryl? I told you that the very first comments, I made my decisions very, very quickly. And yeah, I did basically everything I ever did went like that. I mean, I had a 22 year wall covering service business that I did overnight, basically woke up one morning, decided that's what I was going to do. And the next day, that's what I was doing for the next 22 years. So when you and I were back in the, like you say, that 2008, nine, things were rolling. They were rolling good. We had, we had employees, we had more work than we knew what to do with the economy at that time was good. We could see it was it was faltering a little bit. And then the economy crashed. And that's when 
the world changed. Right. And so you'll know we have a swimming pool in our backyard. Okay. And so you also understand we went to some friend's house on a Saturday that want that had a swimming pool. And Cheryl said, you know, I'd love to have a swimming pool like I used to have at my house. Monday afternoon, Brandy, we're digging a hole. Okay. That's what I mean. That's, That's easy. Huh? Let me give you the real, let me give you the point of that. The placement of the pool is because there was a tree in the backyard that I hated. And so Jerry wanted to save the tree. I made him take a different direction. I laid the pool out around the tree because that tree was going away. Right. And I wanted to do a water garden. So what we ended up doing was we built the pool. We dug the hole, 20 by 40 in ground pool. We investigated. We actually became dealers for a pool line, put this in. And as we're digging it, what did I do? I put a water garden down at the corner of the pool. Okay. The mistake the builder did, he left his bobcat here one day. Next thing I know, hey, I figured out how to crank that thing up. And I dug me out of water pond that day, which is a waterfall in our backyard today. But that's how things move. But see, like I said, I wanted Cheryl to bring up that part of the story. In 06, 07, 08, 09, I had no idea that where I was doing at that point was going to be my final destination. Okay, I mean, excuse me, I thought that's what it was. We were in discussions at that point to open up two remote manufacturing facilities, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast. We had it going on, but all of a sudden we hit the wall because this was during the financial crisis. This is when banks were calling loans and all of a sudden I've got to make a dedicated career change. Okay. Because this is gone. This is not my future any longer. I'm not going to fit into it. I uh, lost a lot during that period of time. And one of the ways we salvaged our outdoor manufacturing business was I sold it to Cheryl, which she had no idea a year before that, that this was going to be all hers on her own. I mean, Brandy, let me give you an example. What would you, you know, what would you think if Jeremy was gone doing something else today. I, I probably wouldn't stay in the business, but it's funny that you bring that up because I've been reading this book um, for a second time. Here comes Cannonball. Yeah. And it's actually about the husband and wife. They started really most, mostly he started. She came later. Um, a HVAC company in San Diego. Uh, they're still there. They're a big company. They're very um, well known, well branded. And it, the story in the beginning is very similar to mine. He started the company and then she came into it just a little bit later. And then they're going on. They think their final destination, you know, is probably to retire together. They have grandkids. However, after 30 plus years of the business, they decide to get a divorce. And they're having an argument because she decided to stay on after they got a divorce. She decided to stay on and work together with them. And they're having an argument one day and she decides she's going to go tell her ex-husband, I'm out of here. I don't want to do it. And he says, buy me out. I don't want to do it. Buy me out. And so she is now the owner and CEO of the company. Right. And you never imagine going through those type of things. But, you know, at this point, and Cheryl, I was pretty well an emotional wreck in 2010. Would you agree when I make that statement? Yeah. And that was one of the times in my life that I was really concerned that things might end literally. Yeah. And if she had been able to read my mind, she was very correct. Because, and I right. And she's actually, and this is the scary part. She's actually a pretty good mind reader. So it's kind of a scary thing. You know, sometimes I wonder she's the kind of person that you decide you'd like to have something to drink. And next thing you know, she's handing it to you without you telling it all these kind of stories. So anyway, I was faced with what do I do? How do I go forward? I'm 57 years old. What do I do? But from that particular standpoint, because of what a friend said to myself and Cheryl in Hartford, Connecticut, he wanted to have breakfast with us. And he said, Jerry, you need to become a coach. It's like, say what? And his name was John Meredith. He, he and I have had a unique relationship. But he said, yeah, these guys need you. 
And I think, Cheryl, did you see a change in my emotional state when we started going back to the airport that day? After the initial, this is not going to work. I did see that in your eyes, like, I'm not ready for this. And then the light bulb went off. The light bulb went off. And I started cooking because what it was is I had a purpose again in life. Because at the age I was, a second career is usually not your choice to go into, okay? It's usually most people are looking at retirement, those kind of things. And I'll be honest with you, I'm firmly convinced that if I take retirement, I'll be dead in 90 days, okay? I'm firmly convinced of that because I've seen it happen way too many times. Drawing Social Security, that's not an interest to me, okay? Living on Social Security, living on any savings we've had, it's just not an interest. But that's what I want to get to is in this show today, I want to talk about how you form your opinions. How do you form what you're going to do? What's going to be your moves as you go forward in life? That's what's important because there's something that really bugs me, which is I see people influenced by charismatic individuals at times that you need to do certain things. And what we end up doing, and I hate to see this, is when we set setting our business sites because it's someone else's vision. Randy, do you have my fears in this? Do you see what I'm talking about? I absolutely do. Yeah, they're living someone else's dream. And it's 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 tragic that this happens. So in our industry, for example, you have everything from one truck companies to 50 plus. And sometimes the one truck individuals that we talk to, they feel pressure to grow and get bigger, even though that's not what they want. And sometimes they go ahead and do it just because of the pressure that they've been influenced by. And then they're very unhappy. So the main thing is, is you have to follow your path and you have to go the direction you want to go, not the direction other people want to go. Right. So Cheryl, let's go to you for a minute. You know, a lot of people think that our company, we work with large companies. They think that what we're doing is, and when we come in, the whole goal is to grow this company, which is so far from the truth, it is unreal. Such as just yesterday, we have several group coaching group coaching groups that get together. We had one yesterday morning and we worked with this group. And when we look at the, at these groups, the amount of the size of the company varies tremendously. Like when we look at the group that we met with yesterday, yesterday some are simply a husband and wife team, one truck at the same time, there's companies in there that are running 15 to 20 trucks in the same room. Did you, but did you see how the challenges of business are so similar to both of these groups? Did we see this yesterday? We did. A business is a business. It, if you're going to have employees, you got to have employees, whether you need one employee or 10 employees. You've got financial things that you have to deal with, whether you're paying for one truck or 50 trucks. It's a business is a business and the decisions are basically made across the board. Um, you're just making them at a different level with a different amount of money and time invested. Yeah. And you know, this is some of the advice I would love to share with you today, because right now I want you to imagine that you have called myself or you have called Brandy or you have called Cheryl and you said, Hey, I'm facing some challenges or I don't know where to go to. And we need some help, which is what we do. We provide people strength. We provide them ideas, concepts. I mean, it's really amazing when we're in a coaching group, somebody will ask a question and Brandy says, I got the form you need. I got next thing's happening is your emails loaded up with links and forms and everything else. That lady's got her fingertips ready to send this. But if you were to call me tomorrow and you knew me or perhaps you didn't know me and you would say, you know, I want I, I need some help to get me to the business. And this is what I tell them. I tell them, I want you to look at a blank wall. Nothing's on that wall. Not like these pictures behind me. Rather, 
There's just a blank wall. Or if you look at Brandy right now, you can tell there's a sheetrock wall. But take those pictures out. I want you to have a blank wall. Because what this is, this is what I want you to turn into a mental canvas. And I want you to look up on that wall that becomes your mental canvas. And I want you to describe your life and your business to me in three years from the day. Not 20 years not five years, three years from today. Because so often people have such long range plans. But if you look at the book Traction, they deal with the Rockefeller principles. They call them rocks, where you got to put together these short term goals with the intention of the long term goal. Because a lot of pe times people don't do this. And a lot of times people start a business. And they don't really think about the exit of coming out of that business one day. So what happens is they work and they work and they work and they work. And then one day they say, you know, I've had it. And I'm going to sell this business. And then comes the disappointing part because they haven't prepared for the exit. It's just like a home that you bought and it's not in a position for sale. So this is how I want you, if you're a listener, to think is paint this picture of your future. Where do you want to land? And once you know where you want to land, we can construct a strategy to get there to make you in the steps to get there. Just like when you build a house, you build the house, you know what it's going to look like when you get done. You've got an architect's rendering, but guess what? you got to start building and digging the footings to start with, laying all the different things. So Cheryl, if somebody called you and says the same question, how would you address them with what you're talking, with what you would say? Basically, I'm not sure a three year out is the way to go. I'm more to give them three steps. What do you want to look like in a year? Then in two, then in three. The reason for that is we've all sit here and talked about the roadblocks that happened almost instantaneously. And it's easier to shift from the one-year plan than it is the three-year plan. So I usually tuck mine probably a lot tighter than you do, but I want them to decide what they want. And then I like to get an idea. Okay, let's say something happened. Can you shift it a little bit right and left? Or do you, or is this too deep embedded to move? Uh, you look more for the final picture. I look more for more like a collage that I can put together when I get there. Got you covered. So Brandy, we'll say you're the person that gets somebody emails you and they say, Hey, I want to set up a conversation with you. And then they come with this question. What's going to be the things that you're going to say to them? Well, I'm again, of course, cause we're always opposite. I'm, I'm more of the very long range. So I would probably have them set down and draw kind of like I did today and then where they want to be, you know, in 20 years and then fill it in as we go and then discuss it. And just like Cheryl said, then they have to have the understanding that that will change and it has to pivot. But it's also kind of neat to go back and look at in 2021, this is where you want to go. And now you're here. Yeah. And that was so impressive a while ago because I know that it is very difficult for Brandy to envision her daughter graduating from high school. This is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be an emotional event. Am I correct, Brandy? Yeah. And I have a son that's graduating this year. So Jeremy and I are definitely thinking, you know, what does the next couple of years look like? Are It's changed vastly now because they can both drive. Yeah. So like I said, one of my fears, Cheryl, is that someone will talk someone due to charisma, due to dangling carrots, whatever it is, and to doing something that doesn't fit themselves, their personality. Gets them to build something that they absolutely positively hate, which we have seen so often happen. What, how, what's your fear in this? Do you share this fear with me? I do. A lot of people are the figment of the last conversation they had. And that's that's not good if it's the wrong conversation, number one. 
And the problem is you hear this one and you change to go there. And then you hear this one and you change to go there. Taking the wrong path is going to, you, you can always come back to that point and go again, but you can waste a lot of time too. But yeah, people do that. They, they listen to, and they think, Oh, the grass is greener here. Always remember the grass is not green on the other side. I mean, some days I even, at 70, I still wake up and wonder, what if I'd have got a real job and worked nine to five and didn't have to bring it home? Would it have been different? And I can tell you right now, I'd have never been happy. But would that have been a different thing for me? So there's always that what ifs in your life that had I had I followed a path of someone else, would it have taken me somewhere? Because my mother was definitely not impressed with the route that I took when I started hanging wallpaper. I should have stayed home, been mommy, white, you know, all the above. So I disobeyed my mom, for lack of a better word, and kind of did what I wanted to do, and which I kind of did since I was three. But it, I've always, I can't, I can't blame other people anymore. And that's where people need to be. They need to make the decisions based on what they want. So they, they don't blame other people all their life. Had it not been for Jerry doing what he did, I wouldn't have been here. I would have been somewhere else. I, I always, and it's my point of view. I always want to be glad to be able to say, I'm glad I did instead of, I wish I had. And that's the way I've lived all my life. Yeah. So Brandy, same question to you. Does my fear, do you share my fear that people will be affected by someone else's actions, their words, and start pursuing something that really is not what they want? Do you share that concern? Yeah, I mean, it's not even just a concern, it's reality, because we see it from time to time. And I'm, I think I'm echoing. <laughs> uh, where I go is live your life authentically. Whatever authentic means to you, live your life authentically. To me, it means I'm not going to be influenced by outside people. Now, am I going to go do research and am I going to listen to them? A hundred percent. But I want to take my own way down this road, not someone else's. You know, a place we commonly see this is second generation um, businesses. So the first generation expects the second generation to take it over. That second generation may not want to take it over. They may have, have other goals and dreams, but they don't want to disappoint their parents. So they take it over and end up living a not authentic life. Right. And like, like I said, in conversations we've had, we've shared with clients that are contemplating selling the business and they have such an emotional attachment. And they're thinking, I got to make sure that I find a buyer that's going to take care of my customers. Well, this is the very real world as it is. If someone buys a business, they're probably going to deviate from what you've done. I even shared this. Yes, I've shared this before that a lot of times somebody stays on as part of the sale. But within a month to two months, usually the new owner sends them packing because they have an influence there that it's impossible to go along. I mean, I'll show you an example. Cheryl owns her manufacturing plant. At one time, I owned that manufacturing plant. I sold it to her, but I could not, you know, it got, it was very hard for me to walk through that plant for a number of years. In fact, still to this day, when I walk in there, it's like, they changed what I used to do. Why did they... You know, they used to weld it this way. Now they changed it that way. And I can't go in and say, Cheryl, you're doing that wrong. What I do is I may ask, hey, it looks like you found a different way to do this. Tell me about it, how you did this. And I'll commonly ask David that. Tell me why you changed the process. I don't come in and say, hey, you're messing up. You need to go back to the way I told you to do it. What's wrong? And that's what you've got to accept. But here's our key thought today. You set your dream destination. You set the GPS, which is the roadmap, to take you there. Just like you're going to take a vacation. Randy, you recently went to San Diego. You look forward. San Diego is one of those places that if Randy could live 
Would Brandy be happy? It's my favorite place on earth. It's her favorite place on earth. For me and Cheryl, it's a Mexican beach. It's going to the places like that if we picked it out. I love the Gulf Coast, all those kind of things. But that doesn't work for everybody. Everybody's got different desires. When we look at it, we got a friend, Bob Bravari. His favorite place is climbing through the snow up to the top of Mount Everest. That makes I got no desire to trudge up the side of Mount Everest and freeze my tail off, but that's his desire. Okay. It's like Bob doesn't understand why I like green grass and lawn. As far as he's concerned, hey, that's ridiculous to be worried about it. I got an army worm problem right now. Bob says, hey, you can eat those things. Okay. I don't think so. We look at things different. So what you got to do is form what your dream is. And my advice, paint that picture. Just like Brandy came up, she drew that line. Here's where I'm going. I mean, hey, she's predicted when her children are going to have children, okay? If you look, she picked the year, okay? I mean, really, you look at it, that's mapping it out. So in a certain year, Brandy's going to have grandchildren. I mean, she probably go ahead and start buying the presents and have them delivered. And that day, hey, go ahead and ship them in on January 15th of this year because I'm going to have a grandchild. So, Cheryl, what would be your closing advice today to people about setting their destination to their dreams? Mine would be set your destination, follow the path. But if the road forks, choose the wiser of the forks that works for you. And again, if that fork doesn't work, go to the next one and change gears. Don't keep on doing what you're doing just for the sake of doing it. Follow your heart, your mind, and that inevitable dream that you're working for. Correct. That's what's that. Randy, what would be your closing advice on today's show? I'm still stuck on, are they army worms or army ants? They're army worms. Army worms. I'm just thinking first world problems that we have. <laughs> and then, But I did have a huge light bulb moment when you were talking earlier, Jerry, about um, people selling their company and not wanting someone to come in and change it. Because I'm like, oh, well, we're here. I'm like thinking, of course you don't want somebody to come in and change it. That's your baby. You grew it. But then on this side, I'm telling people live authentically. So of course that new owner is going to want to make it what it is whatever he wants it to be or she wants it to be. Yeah. So my closing thought would just be to live for you at the end of the day, you and your higher power, that's who you're going to face. So live authentically and don't let outside influences force you to not live your authentic life. That's so true. It's like I said, and I, sh and I shared this with Brandy the other day. One day I was riding down the city street and my grandmother's house had been bulldozed to the ground and they were building a grocery store there. And that was a, had a big effect on me. Another day, Cheryl and I were riding down a nearby street and we rode by the house that we used to own. And it had caught on fire, had burnt down, had to be totally demolished and rebuilt. And later I found it was caused by a dryer vent fire. Okay, took the house to the ground. So these are the type things. And as we go by there now, Cheryl, we see that house. What do we think that new house they built out there? Let's just say not to be rude. I wouldn't live there. Okay. It's a, it's a, and that's a, it's no it is, it's a good word. It is an ugly house. Anybody won't see it. I'll send it. It's like who in the world designed that house? God, it is ugly, but it's what they wanted. But it's their okay. house. All right. So before we go away, Hey, here's the thing we want you to do. The three of us were recently partners and collaborators along with 12 other subject matter experts in this book called the CBC Success Journal. I honestly believe that this will give you significant tidbits of how to go forward. Because what we have here is we have a collection of 15 subject matter experts. Okay. And we're not the big names in this book. We're, I mean, Randy, how honored are you to have write, to write a chapter in a book that Scott McCain, Randy Pennington, Tommy Mello has written chapters in? How does that make you feel about this? Extremely humbled. Right. Did it, but you know, when you see, when you got your first copy in your hand last week, how did it make you feel to look and see that you were part of this journal? 
was very proud of it, especially because you've been telling me for years to write a book and I didn't want to write a whole book. So it was nice that I could just collaborate. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I have to convince Brandy getting her to initially do videos was not an easy task. Getting her to become a published author, because the next thing I'm pushing her is to write a Brandy Biswell book all alone and get it out there for her. So Cheryl, same thing. What about the value in this book? And so people know this is actually the seventh book project that you have participated in. Is my count correct on this? Correct. Yes. Uh, the value is it's unprecedented to me because there's chapters in there that people will not need, but there's chapters that they will. Uh, when you tend to write your own book, you know, it, it follows the subject. But in here, there's 15 different subjects, 15 different minds, and 15 different ways to learn. Correct. So what this book, what each chapter is on, I asked each collaborator, like one of the collaborators is Josh Kelly, who, is, who has created this tremendous digital knowledge base for his customers. So Josh is one of the writers in there. When we look at it, there's other people. I've mentioned some of the names and the list is very long. Like one lady is in there, her name's Jill Stewart and Jill does great photography. So she's wrote a chapter on how to stage the perfect photos for your business. And we keep going through it. Taylor Hill, Carter Hawkins, they're known for marketing, but their articles are actually in other areas of their expertise. So don't expect to read theirs and learn about how to do websites. It's all about the things that I asked them because that's what they're doing. And I haven't even broken this to Cheryl and Randy yet, but I'm already putting together CBC Success Journal Volume 2. So that's going to be coming at you. So you got to be dreaming up what your next chapter is going to be about because that's our next project here that we're going to be rolling out. Because, hey, Cheryl, we ain't going to retire. We're going to keep putting out and offering value. You agree? I do, but I think I've got my next book chapter figured out in there. Good. That's great. So, Brandy. How, how to stop Jerry coming up with so many ideas. It's impossible. You know that. There's only one way that that's going to happen. And, sweetie, you'll miss me. Okay. <laughs> that's, yeah, probably so. That's the only way. So, anyway. We really appreciate you joining us. If you're joining us for the live, because we're also doing our replays at 7 p.m. every Monday evening, Eastern Daylight Time. So we look forward to you joining us live each Friday, 12, 15 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. But also we are posting our live replays at 7 p.m. every Monday, Eastern Daylight Time. So we want to wish you a great week. We want to wish you the best in the world. And most of all, we want you to establish your business dreams that fit your goals, your desires, and where you want to be. So join us next week. We appreciate you being with us here on another episode of the Chimney and Fireplace Success Network. Talk later.